WLRN Edition 67, broadcasting in 3, 2, 1. I was born a woman, off my knees I will stand for my liberation, sisters rise again. I was born a woman, off my knees I will stand for my liberation, rise and rise again. Greetings and welcome to the 67th edition podcast of Women's Liberation Radio News for this Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I'm Aurora Linnea, biophilic feminist and reality enthusiast. This month's edition focuses on a feminist study of death as we shift into the winter season here in the Northern Hemisphere and reflect upon the natural cycles of life and death we experience every year. To accompany this month's podcast, I wrote an essay entitled Doomed Kingdom, Patriarchy and the Flight from Life. It's all about patriarchal culture's creepy, eternal quest to defy and defeat death, and how life is destroyed in the process. You can find it on our website and post it on our social media pages. In today's show, we'll hear an excerpt of an interview April No did with Susan Srigley, a Canadian University professor of religions and cultures who has recently become a death doula. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics, except for separatist feminism, is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. To start off today's edition, here is Jennifer Billick with her monthly special report on the gender industry. Hi all, this is Jennifer Billick from the 11th Hour Blog with a special report on the gender industry for WLRN, Women's Liberation Radio News. I'd like to talk today about Dave Chappelle and what he has done for women in our fight against the gender industry. Whether or not he is an imperfect ally of feminists, as I've heard expressed, there has not been one famous person that has come along to support women resisting the gender industry that has been able to penetrate the mainstream consciousness like Chappelle. Pop culture fame is relevant in America, as it is nowhere else in the world. Though Martina Navratilova and J.K. Rowling are huge cultural icons, their expressed public concerns for women's rights were unable to access mainstream's understanding of the threat that the gender industry poses. The difference is Chappelle, though he probably understands little about women's rights abuses underway and the threat to women's rights posed by the techno-religious cult, he managed to get to the very root of this agenda, which is both totalitarianism and white men's money. It also doesn't hurt that he is man, that he is black, and that he is also very wealthy. The gender industry, now in full swing in many countries beyond America, where its beating heart began, is running roughshod over women's rights, but people aren't paying attention. White women from the wealthiest nations in the world crying over their rights in the face of a technologically engineered media blitzkrieg of propaganda about a suffering minority committing suicide in droves and who are being murdered across the world doesn't cultivate a lot of understanding. Chappelle, on the other hand, went right to the jugular of the gender industry. In his closer performance, causing a riot from TRAs and a walkout at Netflix, the media giant hosting it, Chappelle said, All this talk about how people feel inside. Since when has America given a shit about how any of us feel inside? And I cannot shake the suspicion that only reason everybody is talking about transgenders is because white men want to do it. That's right. I said it. If it was just women that felt that way, or black dudes and Mexican dudes being like, hey, y'all, we feel like girls inside, they'd be like, shut up, nigger. No one asked you how you felt. Come on, everybody, we have strawberries to pick. It reeks of white privilege. You never asked yourself why it was easier for Bruce Jenner to change his gender than it was for Cassius Clay to change his fecking name? What Chappelle has done here is working so much better than the narrative of women's rights versus trans rights. He gets the subtext of what is going on, that it isn't about conflicting rights, 
but that white men's speech is the only speech that matters, while they all scream about diversity and inclusion. Chappelle gets that there is big money behind this, and that's why everyone cares. We have to realize the enormous entertainment bubble that America exists in outside the rest of the world. How influential Hollywood and pop culture has been on our nation since it began, and how entwined it has been with politics. This is also true for the pop music industry. This is a novel thing about America that would be difficult to convey the importance of to anyone outside of our bubble. If we are fighting in America, we must realize not only what we are fighting, but where we are fighting. Tactics used in other countries where pop culture is not as diffuse, in which the general populace is not completely immersed in drowning, will not be as effective in capturing the eye and hearts of American people. The entertainment culture in America is as important as, if not more important, than politicians and government in swaying how people think and respond to their environment. Other comedians and talk show hosts and men have suddenly entered this conversation from the sidelines. It has become their fight, too. This is imperative. Three years ago, Canadian Jordan Peterson was in the public eye passionately imploring us to pay attention to the compelled speech issue of this agenda. Megan Murphy, a spokeswoman for feminists in Canada and the United States, was deeply focused on this angle as well. Women, many on the left, not being fans of Peterson, let go of this thread and grabbed hold of the argument, the angle of safe spaces for women. It is time we took strong hold of this thread again because we need to be speaking in unison with those who are pro-reality, but not necessarily feminists. Those that don't believe in patriarchy, those who are entrenched in pop culture, all races of people, and men. If they can use compelled speech to force us to deny reality, There will be no more talk of safe faces. Thank you. Once again, this is Jennifer Billick reporting from the 11th Hour blog for WLRN, Women's Liberation Radio News. Thank you, Jen, for preparing that special report. Before we dive into our exploration and reflections on death, Here's Emily Ann Lorenzen with Women's News from Around the Globe for this Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I'm Aurora Linnea, and I hope you enjoy the show. Women and feminists in China struggle to escape the shackles of the country's patriarchal, authoritarian government. Women are obtaining undergraduate degrees at high rates, outnumbering males. However, they face barriers and sex quotas when applying for training and graduate programs. For example, a prestigious police academy graduate program admitted five female students out of 140 students who had tested into the program, even though more than 1,000 women had applied. And the lowest scoring woman to get into the program scored 40 points higher than the lowest scoring male to be admitted. This example represents the norm that female students in China face. They must be better than the most mediocre male to even have a slim chance of being afforded the same educational opportunities. Feminism in general is under attack in China. When women posted online about the unfair admissions policies, Social media companies deleted the posts on the grounds of quote-unquote extreme feminism. The Chinese Communist Party promotes censorship and patriarchal gender roles. The government bans the reporting of the hashtag MeToo movement, except when it suits their interests. A manager of the technology giant Alibaba was fired after accusations that he forced an employee to drink until she blacked out before raping her. This public scandal coincided with the government's crackdown on large non-state tech companies. In 2012, a group of feminists campaigned to have more public restrooms for women, since the lack of them was forcing women to use men's restrooms. The Chinese government took credit for creating more public restrooms for women over the past five years. But the women who campaigned for them were not mentioned. These women were forced to stop campaigning, and they are now subject to intense state surveillance. 
Some of them work out in order to cope. One woman said, quote, Many of us suffer from depression or anxiety. Exercise is a way for us to prepare for whatever comes next, good or bad. Unquote. In Japan, a small group of women created a group against self ID laws. They call themselves No Self ID for women's rights and women's safety. Japan's culture enforces rigid sex role stereotypes. And its insidious porn culture reduces women to objects, making feminist efforts more difficult. Self ID is a particularly troubling concept to Japanese women because men often secretly film them in public restrooms. The government is opposed to legalizing same sex marriage, so homophobia is driving more people to identify as transgender, including a growing number of women. The co chair of the group, Uno Ishigami, said, quote, We are focusing on the next parliamentary session. We are also very concerned that the idea of self ID is spreading outside of the legal arena, too. Our struggle will be a long one. We will work together with other organizations and groups, both in Japan and abroad, to stop the self ID system. There is an urgent need to make our voices heard by political parties, the media, and public bodies. Unquote. Over the past week, protesters gathered in Bolivia and called on the Catholic Church to allow an 11 year old girl to have an abortion. The girl was raped by her step grandfather, and her family requested permission for her to have an abortion at 21 weeks. Abortion is legal in cases of rape, incest, or if the life or health of the mother is at risk. The church intervened while the girl was preparing for the procedure in the hospital, convincing the mother to cancel the abortion. The government has spoken out about the girl's injustice. Protesters held signs that said, Girls, not mothers. Pregnancy and childhood is torture. It is not pro-life. It is anti-rights. And today we are here so that childhood and adolescence is not ruined. According to Bolivia's health ministry, there were 953 pregnancies in girls under 15 years old between January and July of 2020. The age of consent in Bolivia is 14. In Madrid, Thousands of feminists gathered in a protest against a bill known as the Trans Law. The bill would allow people of 16 to legally change their name and sex identification on documents without undergoing hormone therapy or receiving a medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria. 14 and 15 year olds would be able to self ID with the consent of their guardian and 12 and 13 year olds would need court approval, while younger children are not allowed to self ID. The bill also bans conversion therapy and expands access to assisted reproduction, such as surrogacy, to homosexuals and the trans identified. Lesbians would be able to be listed as the co parent of a child her partner gives birth to without an adoption. It also expands the rights of intersex people, stating that they will only undergo surgeries to alter their sex characteristics for health reasons, and that children do not need to specify their sex for the first year of their life. This mishmash of a bill is a prime example of how the LGBTQI acronym does not represent a cohesive group with the same needs. The group of protesters read aloud a manifesto with demands, such as the abolition of prostitution and pornography, the prohibition of assisted reproduction through egg retrieval for third parties and surrogacy, and the right to abortion. In the following clip, women are chanting, woman is not a feeling in Spanish. Thank you, Jessica Gonzalez of the Turf Collective for the translation.
In Afghanistan, girls were forced to seek an education underground. There is one secret school in Kabul where 14 girls gather in a basement with the teacher. Under the rule of the Taliban, some cities do not allow girls to attend school after sixth grade, and others do not allow girls to sit with male students. Despite the risk of punishment, the teacher and parents keep the secret school going. Online schools also provide an educational opportunity for these girls. Afghanistan's first all-female coding academy, Code to Inspire, created encrypted virtual classrooms, uploaded course content online, and gave laptops and internet packages to 100 of its students. The University of the People, a U.S.-based organization that provides online courses to students who face barriers to education worldwide, is offering 1,000 scholarships to Afghan women. A nonprofit called Learn has also enrolled 100 girls into an underground school where they learn science, technology, engineering, and mathematics on tablets. One of the students said, quote, It is always said that Afghan women are weak and can do nothing, but I want to prove that we are strong. Unquote. In France, thousands of women have denounced the victim blaming response and the mishandling of their reports of sexual abuse in an online campaign. Anna Tumazov created the hashtag double pin or hashtag double sentencing after she learned that a 19 year old woman was asked by police in graphic terms whether or not she experienced pleasure during a reported rape. At least 30,000 accounts of mistreatment by police were made by women on social media. The government has set the goal to have at least one specially trained officer in each police station for dealing with domestic violence and sexual abuse. Professor Kathleen Stock resigned from the University of Sussex after facing abuse and pressure to leave her position for her gender critical views. An anonymous group called anti turf Sussex launched a smear campaign to get her fired. Posters calling for her termination were plastered around campus, like, Kathleen Stock makes trans students unsafe, and it's not a debate, it's not feminism, it's not philosophy, it's just transphobia. She's the author of Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism, and she has dealt with difficulty at work for the past few years. In a tweet, she said, quote, This has been an absolutely horrible time for me and my family. I'm putting it behind me now. On to brighter things soon, I hope. Unquote. Hate crime charges against Scottish feminist Marianne Millar have been dropped. She was accused of posting homophobic and transphobic material on social media. The Crown Office said that the prosecution remains open and that it reserves the right to proceed, but for now, they have discontinued all proceedings against Marion. She has received global support from feminists, and a video from Sovereign Women Speak in Washington, with women chanting, Women won't wished, went viral. Wished is Scottish slang for shut up. Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, settled a lawsuit brought by 50 women who were victims of sex trafficking. The website Girls Do Porn coerced women into doing pornography and lied about the material being uploaded onto the internet. Girls Do Porn would advertise modeling jobs, then told the women later that the job was for making pornography onto DVDs for private clients. However, the content was uploaded onto sites like Pornhub. Girls Do Porn was shut down by the US Department of Justice when it arrested and charged the site's senior staff with sex trafficking and other offenses. A recruiter, producer, and actor for Girls Do Porn, Ruben Andre Garcia, was sentenced to 20 years in prison in November 2020. The terms of the settlement were not made public. The BBC published an article exploring lesbian accounts of being pressured into sex with trans-identified males. 
The subheader reads, quote, Is a lesbian transphobic if she does not want to have sex with trans women? Some lesbians say they are increasingly being pressured and coerced into accepting trans women as partners, then shunned and even threatened for speaking out. Several have spoken to the BBC, along with trans women who are concerned about the issue too. Unquote. This was a hallelujah moment for lesbians, who have been speaking out about this issue for years. The article was faced with immediate backlash, and those who opposed the article called it a, quote, transphobic hit piece. The hashtag cis with the T began trending on Twitter, but it was met with a dueling hashtag of I stand with lesbians, which was also trending. Thank you to the BBC for publishing lesbian voices and for not backing down. That concludes WLRN's world news segment for Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I'm Emily and Lorenzen. Share your news stories, announcements, and tips with us by emailing info at womensliberationradionews.com and let us know what's going on. This is Joe Brew, and you are listening to WLRN. That was Ava Cassidy with her song, Autumn Leaves. Next up, we'll hear excerpts of an interview April No did with Susan Srigley, PhD, a professor of religions and cultures at Nepissing University, where she teaches courses on death, dying, and spirituality. Susan is a death doula and has been a palliative care volunteer for the past 20 years. She is an advocate for death education and mentors new palliative care volunteers and offers workshops at her local hospice. She loves rescuing animals and one day wants to create an animal hospice. Could you talk about the difference between the palliative care that you've done and what does it mean to be a death doula? Okay, so probably the, the first distinction to make is what is the difference between palliative care and hospice care? And this varies depending on what country you're in. So in the Canadian context, um, palliative care is, not, is, a, is, is a supportive care that is not only for people with a terminal condition. So uh, a young adult can have palliative care. 
um, a middle-aged adult, right? So it's not that you are dying imminently. You have uh, an illness or a condition or a disease for which uh, a certain kind of support is required that, that eases the symptoms of that illness. Hospice care is where you're, you have, normally it's a diagnosis of less than six months to live. And so and hospice care can be residential hospice, like we have in North Bay, Nipissing Serenity Hospice, or it can be home hospice care. Um, and, and that is, you know, the cessation of any kind of treatments that are trying to um, treat the condition. Mm. Uh, so if you were dying of cancer, you would no longer be having radiation or chemotherapy or things like that. But you would be having... Um, you'd still have, you know, pain control and all those kinds of things, comfort measures, um, really sort of allowing the last part of your life to be as full and as complete as possible. And so that's why most hospices are in a home-like setting and, and, you know, they, you know, they have chefs cooking food for you and your families, your families are welcome. There's, you know, all those kinds of things. And so, and then you asked about that in relation to death doulas. So I think, you know, death doulas have connections to hospice palliative care, um, but death doulas are, I think, really a reclaiming of the kind of death care we used to do for our loved ones at home. And death doulas, the, the term doula actually means to serve. So it's um, serving and caring for the dying and all aspects of the of the death spectrum. So that includes um, preparing for death, even before one has a terminal diagnosis or, you know, death doulas work with people in the prime of life to get their affairs in order, how to think about this, think about what you want, think about uh, legacies for your, for your families, wills, uh, all of those kinds of things. Then also guiding through the dying process. So that includes, you know, being there for respite and support for the family, uh, vigiling, sitting with the dying person, and then after a death occurs, the follow-up kind of care. So that could be facilitating a home funeral, helping the people, uh, the, the loved ones, uh, you know, bathe and shroud uh, their person. And, and then potentially having some kind of a home funeral or a service if they want. And then sort of the wrapping up the final kinds of things that you have to do after someone dies the legal things and all that. And so death doulas cover that spectrum, mm -hmm. right? So in the same way that a birth doula ushers in life and supports, you know, women who are, are giving birth and that entire process, death doulas help usher us out of this life and all of the attending things around it. And so, you know, and they could be doing, you know, some might focus on some parts of it and some focus on other parts of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was reading about... <clears throat> like becoming a death doula and what it what it meant and stuff I felt like there was a lot more education work and you know and and I think about it too in terms of like how far we've gone like we've almost sanitized the process completely yeah. away from our lives I know it's and and you know that's completely. the amazing thing we have completely outsourced death I think that's really the issue here yeah. we have outsourced death to the modern funeral industry a multi-billion dollar industry may I add <laughs> right um, death work has always been done uh, in the home, usually by women, uh, with lots of kids around and the families, right? People coming and going. And I think that, you know, it's really only in the last hundred years or so that we have done this outsourcing of our death work. And, you know, I think that the ones who are picking it up now, again, are largely women who are reclaiming what all of our ancestors did. Mm -hmm. They're reclaiming uh, an act of love that we have been deprived of. And I think that this is a real loss. And I, th I really do believe that it is a loss for our culture mm -hmm. and it has contributed to our death denial. It has contributed to our fears and phobias around death. And it has you know, frankly, it has terrified my students. Mm -hmm. And I deal with so much death anxiety in my students that is often alleviated over the course of a term of taking a course because, 
you know, mm-hmm. I get to remind them of, you know, the, the naturalness of death, the normalcy of death, and to show them that the reason they are so fearful is because they haven't ever seen people die. They haven't been around death, right? So think of anything that is unknown. So we have the unknown of what happens after we die. That's the big mystery, right? Which can be terrifying, but also fascinating. But we also have the unknown of we just, we don't, we just don't know what it looks like to die. We don't, we don't even know how to die. It yeah. is as simple as being in a room with someone who is dying. The more you do it, the more mm-hmm. you see how natural and normal it is. The, you know, hospice nurse Julie is someone I follow on Instagram. And, and she said recently on a podcast about how, you know, the body is, you know, the body is made to be born. Like it's equipped with all that's necessary for a birth to happen, both for the mother and the being that's being born into the world. And the body also knows how to die, right? It has a very complex process of shutting down that is part of the death process. Mm -hmm. And it knows how to do it. I think what we're lacking is, you know, the the spiritual and emotional uh, intelligence around working with that thing that our body knows how to do. And I think we don't know it and we don't practice it because we don't talk about it. So And we hide it. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the outsourcing. You know, like I think about my neighbor who like as soon as a leaf falls, he like quickly hurries to like <laughs> grab it. Or if there's like a little hint that there's going to be like dandelion on the lawn, <laughs> he's like mowing it over. And I feel like this is just a continuation with us not really wanting to even admit uh-huh. that we're part of the natural world, yes, right? That dies. That dies. You know, cyclically all the time in front of our eyes. Like, could you imagine the whole world full of people who just don't die? Um, it can't really function. Like, that's how life begins. Life begins with yeah. a death. I mean, one of the hardest things to accept in my life was the fact that things had to die for me to be alive. I think you should worry about those things. I think it's important. But, you know, another way of thinking about it is just the fact that we are all interconnected. So to think about interconnectedness is not as much as a focus on this thing died for me, but that this is true of all of us in so many different complex ways of the entire world, right? And I think being mindful of that interconnectedness Mm. is something that actually contributes to a better way of recognizing, you know, how precarious things are. I think that matters. And I think that changes the way we live in the world. This, this, this sense of awareness, I think, is the more important thing. I think for the most part, what I witness in society, in our modern Western society, is, is a complete lack of awareness. But I think most people don't think about them. And I, I want to encourage people. That's what I think education is about, is encouraging people to be aware of who they are and where they are and, and where they fit into this very complex web of systems, mm-hmm. right? Because... If we don't think about that, if we're just staring at our screens and avoiding all that's out there. I mean, to be out in nature is to learn about death. I think you're absolutely right. Um, Comparable experience. I did uh, an art of dying retreat with a couple of um, women who are um, uh, Buddhist teachers. And one of the practices that we did was going through a process of our body shutting down and death occurring. And so it's, it's, you know, based on some Buddhist scriptures and, you know, we were all lying down in the meditation hall and we were essentially being guided through the process that happens as your body uh, slowly, as the elements of your body dissolve. And I also found that this in, to be this incredibly organic, beautiful you know, process. And, you know, really most of this, you know, is just familiarizing yourself with the Mm -hmm. reality of who and what you are, which is a mortal being, which is going to die. And it's not, it's not, you know, you'd think that that's, you know, scary. And there are groups who do living funerals, who, you know, get together and have these sessions where everyone's lying in coffins, imagining it. Because if you talk to people Mm -hmm. of what they're afraid of when you talk about death, the biggest fear that my students and that people I talk to have is, is not about death per se. That's so, it seems so abstract. I'm not afraid. They'll say, I'm not afraid of death. Um, but then they'll say, but I'm afraid of like what it's going to feel like. And is it going to be painful that like that moment of transition, 
you know? I, you know, I just taught a section of my course on children, death and dying, and children's experiences about dying. Um, you know, if I were to summarize that entire lecture, I would say don't lie to kids about death. Mm. Um, and, you know, explaining very particular things about death to children is really important. And I think it's the place we have to start in our cultural transformation around death. Because if we lie to kids about death, we increase their anxiety. We create anxiety when we don't talk about death, and we alleviate anxiety when we talk about it. And kids will go to great lengths to, you know, try to figure out what is going on when nobody is telling them anything. And they witness their parents crying and they see these things happening and they don't know what it means and no one is telling them what it is. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart. And what I have discovered in my university classes and particularly on discussions with children about death and dying is that they are the product of that attitude towards children. Mm -hmm. And so it hit a nerve, I think, with these 18, 19, 20-year-old students who read this and witnessed it and said, yeah, that's what happened to me. Grandpa died, he disappeared, mm -hmm. and no one ever talked about it again. Or my friend in high mm -hmm. school died, and no one talked about it. There was no space for the conversations. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think death denial is not just something that I, you know, work really hard to, um, you know, to, to illuminate and bring out into the open and have conversations about, but it's damaging. It's da it has really damaging effects. And I think that there's not enough attention being paid to the fact that this is a really damaging culture. It's an anxiety producing culture. It's, it, 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 you know, it leaves people feeling, you know, just terribly afraid of something that is so completely normal and natural. And that's what I, you know, that's why I think death education is so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it also does kids a disservice. Our culture, you know, tries to make death something, this is the problem, tries to turn death into something morbid. And by turning it into something morbid, ensures that we never talk about it. Just as a feminist, I think about how paradoxical it is to have a culture that is hell-bent on killing the living world. <laughs> and, yet, and yet here we are, like, um, refusing to talk about our own mortality. Yep. Because I feel like for me... It, it does go in line with our separation from nature. Well, the natural, I mean, you know, just to continue that paradigm, you know, Francis Bacon, what, what did Francis Bacon say about the natural world? Just sort of the beginning of this, you know, raping and pillaging of earth. You know, we're going we're gonna to put nature to the rack and we're going to make her answer our questions, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that very patriarchal, uh, you know, way of thinking about the natural world is the one we've all inherited. Um, and it's, you know, in some ways, I, I think that what death doulas are doing, and I'm sure there are some uh, men who are death doulas, all of the death doulas I know happen to be women, but uh, I think that the death work that they and I are doing is a form of resistance to the patriarchy. It is reclaiming the work of our ancestors, it is reclaiming the work that we have always done i love it yeah it's reclaiming our it's reclaiming our spot in the natural world too right yeah. yes do you feel like being a lesbian allows you to have a unique view when doing the work that you do i guess it, well i i guess if anything it just is it gives me an insider's view to the ways in which, uh, you know, people are marginalized in their, in their care and in their dying in particular. Uh, and, you know, especially I would say for, for me personally and for a lot of, you know, other lesbians uh, that I know that one of the biggest concerns has, around end of life has to do with family coming in and trying to 
override, you know, relationships that might not be, you know, legal marriages and so on. And the, the silencing or the, you know, invisibility of one's partner. And, and there are lots of incidences in which this has, you know, been really tragic in people's experiences of end of life. But, but, but to, to, but to widen that, you know, my, my, my death education courses, and I teach two of them at my university, uh, but the one where I talk about end of life care in particular has turned into a social justice course. Um, amazing health justice activists like Nahid Dosani, who's coming to my class next week, uh, who are, you know, providing palliative care to the homeless for people who have homes. You know, the question that's always asked, you know, where do you want to die? The majority of people will answer that question and say they want to die at home. What is in fact the case is most people die in hospital, more people die in hospital than at home. But what if you don't have a home, right? So, so I think that all these little cracks in the edifice of this notion of the good death are revealing the ways in which our society and our culture are failing the most vulnerable around us. Um, and so I think that this is why it's important in death education, which is what I am doing, to ensure that my students are aware of all of these things. Yes. You know, I've taught religion for, you know, 25 years, but I well, would still not feel competent to say that I know yeah. what every different religious yeah. group needs in end of life. So we have to find ways to be attentive and open and aware yeah. to, to what people need and to listen to them, right? We don't have to understand it, but we have to listen to them and hear them. Yeah. The kind of things I'm teaching, the kind of work we're doing together, it's so personal, it's so intimate in so many ways, and it just doesn't seem right. I, you know, if, if, if my understanding of good death care means that as a death doula, as a death worker, as someone who is companioning those who are dying, it, it always comes from a position of a fellow mortal, that, mm -hmm. that, I am, that I am going to be there too. And so there has to be that identification. And so as a death educator, I feel like it's just, it's a natural consequence of the way I think about death work, the way I think about the, the work I do in education. We are yeah. all, you know, yeah. in the same space. Mm. Yeah. So what made you want to become a death doula in the first place? Um, I, I came into death work the way most of the people I have seen come into death work. Um, and that is through experiencing a death. And not just that, but experiencing a, a death it, the death wasn't traumatic, but my experience and the after effects of it was traumatic. And that was the death of my father 21 years ago. Um, and he died of cancer and he was able to be at home, taken care of by my mother and my siblings who were running the family business. So all of us made it possible for him to die at home. And, you know, I tell this story a lot, but we were sitting there one night, my dad and I, and my mom had gone to bed and we were holding hands and he was on his hospital bed in the living room and I was lying on the couch beside him. And he thanked me for being there. And I said, of course. And then he said, what, what do people do who don't have someone to be here mm -hmm. with them like this. He was thinking about other people who don't have a family. And look, I don't have children. So, you know, this has always been a really powerful kind of emotion for me uh, to, you know, to anticipate my own end. I'm hoping my students come through. <laughs> and then I feel like, you know, all the students over all the years in death education will all be, you know, death doulas and so on, and they'll come and help me. But but not having that, you know, that family there. And we're a really tight family, and I think we gave my dad the best end of life uh, possible. But I was really traumatized by that death, and it, it, it mostly in the form of a kind of shutting down um, because of, you know, the fear of how that much love hurts when it ends. Within a year of my father dying, I did go to the Palliative Care Association where I lived and did the training to become a palliative care volunteer and started volunteering. And I, because what I have later come to realize is that my dad's question to me that night uh, was his, you know, direction for me or his advice to me or a calling that I had to follow 
which is I have to go and be with the people. I don't want people to die alone. And I think that that's, you know, really more than anything, I think this is something that I feel the most passionately about. And that's why I continue to volunteer uh, as a palliative care volunteer with our local traveling hospice. And it has really helped me. I've, I've often said that doing palliative care work, um, working with new mentor, like mentoring new palliative care volunteers and teaching death has been a form of therapy for my own death anxiety, but also because I want to ensure that my students and the coming generations do not experience the trauma I had experienced. I really think that had I been part of the death positive movement, had I been aware of this, had I witnessed more death and been around death and more comfortable with death, that I would not have been so traumatized. So that's a really important goal, is to reduce death trauma, death anxiety. And the only way we're going to do that is to start talking about it. The only way we're going to do it is to educate ourselves, to bring death back into the home, uh, and to have those difficult conversations. This. 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 This is WLRN. 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 Women's Liberation Radio News. Women's Liberation Radio News. Women's Liberation Radio News. Women's Liberation Radio News. I've spent most of my life thinking about death. It's safe to say everything in my life is ultimately about death. Specifically my own, of course. I do my best to filter my decisions, my actions, and my way of living through my anticipation of dying. One day, when I'm dying, I will look back on my life, at who I was and what I did. And when I do, I want to feel proud. I want to feel satisfied and at peace. I want to feel like if I could go back and do my life over again, I would do most of it exactly the same way. My goal is to die confident that I lived with integrity and always adhered to my core values. All living things have a primal, biological, irrational fear of death. One thing that separates human beings from other animals is our ability to think about and reflect on death from a more sophisticated intellectual place, even as the lizard part of our brains motivates us to live at all costs. On that intellectual level, I don't fear death and never really have. I don't understand why most other people do to the point of wishing for immortality. I've always seen death as the ultimate relief. For women and girls the world over, it's the only real, lasting relief we're ever going to get from male oppression. The only escape from the threat of male violence and sexual terrorism, and a permanent one at that. I know it's a dark take, but the inevitability of death means that our collective female suffering is temporary. Our individual suffering is too. Death will do what feminism can't, liberate us from males forever. It's not news that men as a group fear death to an extreme degree in ways women as a group don't. Men not only fear their own individual deaths, but their categorical extinction, which has always motivated them to control women's reproductive power and spawn sons at any cost, even if they have no interest in parenting. They may not be able to live forever literally, but they've convinced themselves they can do it indirectly through their sons. Hence their long-time petty obsession with passing on their surnames generation to generation, something they never gave women the option to do. Men's criminalization of abortion, their arguing against it on moral grounds, is really just about their fear that women will eliminate them altogether tipping the balance of power in the easiest way possible. 
Men can't oppress, control, and rule over women if they don't exist, or if they're a tiny minority in the human population. That's why men continue to make it difficult for young women to undergo voluntary sterilization and to access birth control around the world. Set aside the standard questions of the abortion debate concerning the definition of viable human life and consider why men, who invented war, who represent almost 100% of murderers internationally, who have always delighted in violence as entertainment and sport, would make a fuss over women deciding to have abortions. They don't have a problem with ending human life when they can do it on their terms. They kill women, children, and each other all the time, all day, every day. In the right context, they praise each other for it. They don't have a problem with killing. They have a problem with women being the ones to decide whether males live or die. The one power men don't have is the power to create life. They can only take it away, and they've been doing that since the beginning of time. Without women's cooperation, the male sex wouldn't exist, and men have always known that. They can't create themselves, and they can't live forever. So they'll forcibly impregnate women and girls and challenge those women and girls' access to abortion. I don't subscribe to the glorification of motherhood or the female reproductive function as the indicators of our value as women. I don't think you should either. But the point is, all human life comes through us. We are the creators. We are the life givers. I think this fact is one reason why we're also better at handling death and mortality than men are. Life and death coexist in a balance. All living things die, and that's beneficial to nature at the very least. Immortality is unnatural. And while the natural and the good are not always one and the same, it's very clear that any method men might use to achieve immortality would be perverse and horrifying. There is no healthy, humane, benign way to cheat death permanently. Eliminating death would cost us our quality of life, which is why you hardly see any women interested in trying to pull it off. As women, we understand that death is the natural, logical, and meaningful conclusion to life. Even women who are scared of their own death, or who hate the experience of grief that comes after a loved one dies, understand enough to have no interest in becoming half-robot or uploading their consciousness into a computer. There's a common idea that without death, life would have no meaning. I'm not sure I agree. I'm not even sure how we should define meaning in this context, but I do think that death forces us to recognize what is valuable to us. Because we're going to die, our time in these bodies and on this earth is limited, which means we should take it more seriously than if we had eternity. Who we choose to be, what we choose to do with our lives, who we choose to love, and how we love them. All of these choices have a weight to them because of our limited time. Most women in this world will never be feminists. They will live their lives cooperating with men and holding up patriarchy to one degree or another. They will do what men want them to do because it's easier and more comfortable than the feminist path. They will allow men to define them, to steer their choices, to consume their time. I imagine plenty of these women will reach the end of their lives without a sense of satisfaction or pride and with plenty of regrets. Many of them will also die believing they did the right thing by living a life in service of patriarchy. Most of them won't have much to show for it. Our mortality begs the question, in the big picture, do we want our lives to contribute to male power or to female well-being? When you're dying and you look back on your life, do you want to see that you spent it on men? Or do you want to go out knowing that you gave your life to women? 
If the feminist movement is a lost cause, a hopeless struggle against male power, it's easy to write it off as pointless. But the finite nature of our lives as women, our inevitable deaths, means that our choice to live either feminist lives or patriarchal ones will determine the final value of our lives to ourselves and to other women. Instead of asking what's the point of being a feminist if patriarchy will never end, ask yourself, what do I want the point of my female life to be? The point of radical feminism has never been to change men. Its purpose is to change women into female identified women, into woman loving women, into women who challenge male power. If you allow feminism to transform you in these ways, you will not live the same kind of life you would have lived as a male identified, man loving, misogynistic woman. You'll live a life that however difficult and painful, will make you proud and give you a sense of accomplishment when it's finally over. Because you're going to die, the way you live matters. When I die, I hope I see that my presence on this earth made a positive difference to other women, personally and politically. I hope your own dying grants you that knowledge about yourself and your life, too. If it does, then our feminism was more than worth it. Thanks for listening to WLRN's 67th edition podcast on A Feminist Study of Death. WLRN would like to thank our guest this month for sharing her views on death, dying, and the importance of death education. Thank you so much, Susan Srigley, for speaking with us. Until next time, this is April No, signing off on another WLRN podcast. If you like what you are hearing and would like to donate to the cause of Feminist Community Radio, please visit our WordPress site and click on the Donate button. Check out our merch tab to get a nice gift in exchange for your donation. And if you're interested in joining our team, we're always looking for new volunteers to conduct interviews, write blog posts, post to our Facebook and other social media pages, and do other tasks to keep us moving forward as a collective of media activist women. Thanks for listening. This is Jenna signing off for now. And I am Thistle Pedersen. Hey, I'm celebrating the release of my new album of original music called Spinning and Weaving. I named it after the song Elizabeth Miller commissioned me to write for her 2021 feminist anthology by the same name. To support my handcrafted feminist folk, go to thistlepetterson.com to learn more and purchase Spinning and Weaving, the musical album. And as always, thank you for tuning in to WLRN, dear listeners. Next month, we'll focus our program on women's intentional communities. Our handcrafted podcasts always come out the first Thursday of the month, so look for it on Thursday, December 2nd at an internet near you. Stay strong in the struggle, and thanks again for listening. This is Emily Ann Lorenzen, signing off on another edition of WLRN's monthly handcrafted podcast. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spinster, Over It, and SoundCloud, in addition to our WordPress site. Thanks for listening. And this is Aurora. Our monthly podcasts are always crafted with tender loving care and in solidarity with women worldwide. Thank you for your support. We would love to hear from you, so please do share, like, and comment widely. But how will we find our way out of this? What is the antidote for the patriarchal kiss? shown and then after that where is home